Rick has given you a good broad scale look at some of the factors affecting salmon and steelhead recovery across the entire Columbia River Basin. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to scale down and focus on the Middle Fork Salmon River Basin here in central Idaho. And basically, I'm going to give you a case study of wild Chinook salmon in wilderness habitat. The Middle Fork stocks are really good indicators of factors influencing recovery of not only Salmon River Basin stocks, but also across the entire Snake River Basin and perhaps even across the Columbia. Most landscapes are altered. One of the best exceptions is the Frank Church Wilderness. It supports a very large area of exceptionally high quality habitat. It provides habitat for a variety of VSA listed and sensitive species. And the Middle Fork is an excellent location to study populations such as salmon steelhead because we can control for several of the variables that Rick talked about, the four H's. For example, habitat. The Middle Fork has diverse, high-quality, complex, connected natal habitats, spawning and rearing habitat. So essentially, the habitat age you can take off the table. Secondly, it has only wild indigenous salmon. There are no hatcheries in the Middle Fork system. Third, harvest rates based on quarter wire tags and based on the regulated tribal fishery are relatively low for these stocks. And it's been 39 years since you could legally harvest a wild salmon in the Middle Fork system. Pretty poor batting average, 0 for 39. So as scientists, we can ask several key questions. How do we conserve what remains? Based on the information Rick presented, we know we have remnants of former immense populations. Secondly, where are salmon likely to persist in the future? And third, how can we inform recovery of these populations? So the approach that we've taken in the Middle Fork is to actually census or count the population using reds as surrogates for adults. And this is a red, the female excavates an area, and then she buries the fertilized eggs in layers and covers them. And for our stocks, the average female produces about one red. So if you multiply reds times two, that gives you a good approximation of adult salmon numbers. The second thing we're doing is we're evaluating the genetic structure of these stocks. And third, we're describing the habitat and the processes that create and alter those habitats. I want to acknowledge several collaborators, both other scientists, physical scientists and biologists here at the Rocky Mountain Station, as well as biologists and managers from Idaho Fish and Game, the Shoshone Bannock, and Nez Perce tribes, NOAA Fisheries, Fish and Wildlife Service, and also biologists on the national forest, but particularly district and forest bio, as well as researchers, students, and postdocs at a variety of universities. We have several remarkable data sets we're working with. The first one I'll call the Idaho Fish and Game IDFG Index Red Count Database. This has been standardized since 1957. It's an invaluable now 60-year database and counting. It was created and maintained by iconic biologists, including Forrest Houck, Connie Richards, and Stacy Gupphart. And on the map on the left, the red areas are the index areas within the Middle Fork system, six different major drainages. The second database we'll call the RMRS Red Count Database. This has been annually replicated now 22 years. It's a complete census, meaning we're counting all potential spawning areas in the entire Middle Fork system. Not only the index areas, but the entire spawning area. That's what a red looks like from the air. Third, we have a lot of information we can get from carcasses. Today I'm just going to focus on fin clips and DNA microsatellites. Third, we're mapping the habitat both on the ground and working with geomorphologists to predict substrate locations. And then we're assessing the effects of widespread natural disturbances. There have been a lot of fires in the Middle Fork in recent decades. From 1990 to 2013, more than 52% of the basin is burned. So a lot of natural processes operating in that system. Application of these data sets, if you remember one thing from today's uh, seminar, please remember how unique these middle fork fish are. No other spring summer stocks in the world spawn as high or migrate as far. They're adapted to a very dynamic environment in the middle fork system. They spawn at the highest elevation of any spring summer Chinook stock in the world. 
Wild indigenous fish like this, wild native fish, are extremely rare. Across the Columbia River Basin, only 4% of the historical spring summer Chinook habitat still supports wild fish. Everywhere else, they've either been extirpated or they've been altered by hatchery fish introduction. Third, these fish have remarkable diversity in terms of life history and age. We have fish that spend less than a year, one year, and two years in fresh water, and then we have corresponding saltwater ages. Most of our fish spend one year in fresh water, and most spend two or three years in salt. However, within each of these freshwater ages, there's up to six different saltwater ages. So if you look at all possible combinations, we have the potential for 18 different age classes contributing from the prior eight brood years of, of returning salmon. That remarkable diversity spreads the risk, buffers fluctuations in the population, and enables stocks to adapt to this very dynamic environment. These fish are also still genetically diverse, despite the very low numbers we've had, particularly since the mid-90s. They retain both within and across population differentiation. Basically what that means is the fish that spawn in Lower Camas Creek around Myers Cove are different than the fish that spawn above Castle Creek in the headwaters. And the fish in Camas differ from Loon, differ from Big Creek, for example. So these fish are really the best of the best. They have this remarkable genetic diversity, life history diversity, and they're wild indigenous fish. We can also ask questions about the spatial dynamics of the populations. How are the reds and populations distributed across space and time? Here's an example of an annual red distribution. This is year 2000. There were 661 reds in the Middle Fork drainage. Each red dot represents a red. And we have this type of data now for 22 consecutive years starting back in 1995. So as these populations expand and contract, it gives us a lot of analytical power to look at their population dynamics. We can ask questions about population trends. Here's the Middle Fork data from the IDFG index red counts. We can ask, how do these populations compare to the overall Snake River Basin? Here's a plot of the snake that Rick showed earlier. And you can see these populations are almost mirror images. Despite the fact that Middle Fork has optimal habitat, no hatcheries, and low harvest. So this really suggests that there's one of the H's that is driving the trajectory of both of these populations. Here's the RMRS complete census. This is our best estimate of the total number of reds built in the Middle Fork each year since 95. You can see 1995 was a historical low. There were only 20 two zero reds in the whole Middle Fork Basin that year. Contrast that with 2001, we had about 1,800 reds. You can see the distribution of reds. We've averaged 811 reds the last 22 years, and I'll put that in context here in a minute. 2017, the forecasts are pretty bleak. It's probably going to be the fourth year in a row we've had a decline. The forecast suggests we probably are going to be looking at around 600 reds in the whole Middle Fork system in 2017. We can ask questions about resiliency, and resiliency is ability to withstand negative conditions that would cause stocks to be extirpated, and conversely, ability to respond when conditions improve. One of the ways we can measure resiliency is look at a recruit per spawner analysis, and I don't have time to go into the details. You can look up and read this paper, but basically, the results of the earlier analysis we did reveals that these are among the highest recruit per spawner values recorded for spring summer Chinook. So this is really an indicator of resilience in these stocks, and it's probably a result of two factors. One is the exceptional high quality habitat they have access to, and secondly, the high fecundity or egg production. Our average female produces more than 5,000 eggs. So for every additional 100 females that return, that's a huge potential production of juveniles. Here's more evidence of resiliency. Rick talked about the Snake River and noted that little spike there that we'd come back to. Well, that increase occurred here in 2001, 2002, 2003. In those three years, we had a four to five-fold increase in number of returning adult salmon to the Middle Fork drainage. It was a result of two factors, more water, faster travel time, more survived through the migration corridor to the estuary, and then when they hit the ocean, there was an upturn in ocean productivity. There was a cold water upwelling, more food, more food of higher lipid content, copepods, for example, 
So we had higher survival rates. And what's really remarkable is look at the prior four years to those three years. Those were extremely low years, yet those populations really rebounded. So that's an indicator of resiliency. And I remember there were newspaper articles that said we've solved the salmon recovery crisis. But from 2003 to 2006, we had a tenfold decline. So that really illustrates that the factors that cause these stocks to be listed in the first place are still in place. We basically were fortunate Mother Nature did us a favor those years. We can ask questions about landscape processes. And the extensive fires coupled with storms result in debris flows that create these alluvial fans. And these have been widespread across the Middle Fork system the last several decades. We also see localized huge inputs of large wood off fires and then snow avalanches. This is an upper Big Creek. There were three of these. And incidentally, the Chinook made it through those just fine. Here's an example from Pistol Creek. We mapped the distribution of debris fans. Those are the white symbols. And log jams are the green Xs from 03 to 2014. We can ask the question, how do the fish respond to these? Well, one indicator of that is the distribution of reds. And what you see is the reds are very closely associated with these natural processes on the landscape. So essentially, these post-fire debris flows are replenishing spawning gravels in these high, elevate, high gradient systems. So to bring this together, so these essential natural ecological processes, fires, floods, debris flows, alter the landscape to create and maintain a diverse habitat template, which in turn allows for the expression of salmon life history diversity and genetic diversity. And those in concert lead to population resiliency that we're experiencing. So if we're going to build a blueprint for recovery of stocks, not only in the Middle Fork, but also to a broader area in the Snake River Basin. And as I mentioned, the Middle Fork is a good indicator of factors influencing your recovery across the Snake as well, because we have other areas of high quality habitat in the Snake. We have the Clearwater System, the Loxa, the Selway, the Upper Salmon Basin. So what would we want to enhance recovery? We'd want diverse genetics. We want abundant quality connected habitat. We want unique locally adapted salmon. And we want evidence of resiliency that they will respond. So the good news is recovery is biologically feasible. We do have the building blocks in place, not only in the Middle Fork, but in the other parts of the Snake River system to recover these populations. So there is good news. It's feasible to recover these fish. However, we need to be clear in informing policy decisions that these populations are at risk. They're at risk because they fail to meet viability criteria. Viability criteria are ESA-driven biological performance measures. And here's an example. This is from NIMS recovery plans. All Middle Fork populations fail to meet viability criteria because they're at high risk from low abundance and low productivity. Here's an example from Marsh Creek. The blue bars are where we are in terms of abundance and productivity. The green bars are the goal. And so there's a gap from where we currently are to where we need to be to achieve recovery. So there's troubling news. Despite the fact we have these unique wild stocks and a core wilderness habitat, they're still at high risk of extirpation. So the biops that Rick mentioned, will the focus on natal habitat fill that gap? The evidence is no, it won't. Again, here's a NIMS document. Natal habitat actions in the Middle Fork will not produce the increases in survival needed for this population to achieve viability. And that result is going to be consistent wherever we have high quality natal habitats. One of the reasons is the Middle Fork possesses tremendous high quality habitat. Here's a quote from Chapman in 1940. Middle Fork possesses immense spawning areas for spring Chinook, which to my knowledge are not surpassed or even reached in quantity or quality any place else. So the habitat is there. And Rick showed this graph. There's some optimal habitat potential. There's some ability to recover, depending on how degraded it's been. But the Middle Fork data illustrates that even when you have high-quality habitat, there's still a gap between that high-quality habitat and recovery. So trends in wild stocks and wilderness confirm that within-basin actions are not sufficient to recover these populations. Here's more evidence that it's outside basin factors that limit recovery of these stocks. So 
there's been an assumption in the past of something called underseeded habitat. And basically, that means not enough adults spawning in the habitat to achieve recovery. So if we could just get more adults into the habitat, then we should see these kind of trajectories. We had that in 01, 02, 03. We would expect the populations to either increase, maybe stay flat, maybe slightly decrease. What actually happened is this. The reason is, despite having more adults in the habitat spawning, more juveniles produced, we couldn't successfully get those juveniles to the ocean and then back as adults. So increased mortality outside the snake basin negated the benefits of those increased adult returns. So it's those outside basin factors that are driving these trajectories. So another conclusion is outside basin actions are going to be essential to increase SARs to that fourfold goal that the council set. These stocks are also at risk because of low abundance. As I mentioned, we've averaged 811 reds the last 22 years. How does that compare to historical abundances? Our best estimates of 1950s, 1960s abundances were around 23,000 reds. So we're currently operating about 3 to 4 percent of the 1950s levels. And if you look at the historical data on the historical fishery, the 50s and 60s arguably were about 30 percent of the 1870s. So if that's the case, then the Middle Fork potentially could have supported 70,000 reds. And if that seems like a ridiculously high number, ponder this. In the 1940s, the Bureau of Commercial Fisheries mapped all the spawning areas in the Middle Fork. And then they estimated the number of Chinook that could spawn in that habitat. And their estimate was 92,000 reds. So the truth is probably somewhere in between those two numbers. And again, keep in mind, since 95, we've averaged 811 reds. So Rick mentioned the shifting baseline syndrome, lack of awareness of historical abundances, overlooking true production potential. And one of the results is setting unrealistically low recovery goals. For the middle fork, the NOAA viability goal, it's a minimum viability goal, is only 2,500 reds. So we can also conclude that current salmon populations and recovery goals are far below the productive potential of this system. And finally, a changing climate adds urgency and a need for urgent action. We're, we know that climate change is here. We're seeing warmer air temps, altered hydrology, increased wildfire, except for this year, declining snowpack. It's a core fact. What's the effect going to be on salmon? Not good. Main stem migration corridor issues we're already experiencing. We see delayed migration, temperature barriers, hope migration, fish stray in other areas, which is, is a net loss for us. We even see migration failure. Secondly, we've already seen shifts in adult migration timing. Bonneville River temp temperatures of Bonneville Dam are steadily increasing. This is resulting in earlier and earlier migration dates for spring Chinook. And that's bad news, because the earlier they come in from the ocean, the smaller they are, the fewer eggs. So that's a net loss in production. Third, we're also seeing death. 2015, low flow and hot water conditions killed nearly 380,000 sockeye. How were Snake River stocks affected? 96% of Snake River sockeye that reached Bonneville died before they passed Lord Granite. And we're also going to see freshwater habitat issues as lower elevation habitats warm and become unsuitable, so a reduction in habitat and population. However, highest elevation habitats, such as we have an abundance of in the Snake River Basin, will provide cold water refugia. And this was recently confirmed by a paper by Isaac and others here at the Rocky Mountain Station. So a changing climate adds urgency and will exacerbate main stem passage issues and reduce freshwater habitat. However, if restored, wild Idaho salmon and steelhead may be uniquely adapted to buffer against a changing climate. So restoring salmon and steelhead to the snake is important not only for the snake basin and all the ecological and economic and recreational benefits, but also important because these stocks could actually function to refound stocks at lower elevations if we eventually get our act together on climate change. There's something people have called dynamic tension, and I want to leave you with this. So snake river populations are at very high risk because of these outside basin factors, because of low abundance, because of a changing climate, and some of the things like we witnessed in 2015. However, 
these populations are also very resilient. They have cold water refugia. They have access to very high quality habitat. This resiliency that we demonstrated. So the good news is they will respond if we take actions to restore the populations. 